This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. This episode is brought to you by new green tech company, Harvest. The company's recently launched smart web-connected mini greenhouses are designed to help people grow more at home with less effort and minimal space. Choose between the yard and the terrace. Both are simply popped directly on the ground or patio. They're self-watering, climate controlled, space efficient and enable you to grow your own produce without the need to tend every day. So whether you're a budding beginner or a seasoned pro, visit www.harvest.co.uk and take advantage of a 5% discount on all four seasons and eco mini greenhouse orders from now until the end of July. Simply enter the code ROOTS and ALL, all uppercase, at the checkout. This episode, I'm speaking to Canadian gardening superstar Nikki Jabour. Nikki is a gardener and author of three books, including Growing Undercover, which is the most comprehensive guide to using crop covers in your vegetable garden. It's based on Nikki's first-hand, decades-long research into successfully growing food, which enables her to produce food 365 days a year in the challenging climate of Nova Scotia, and what she doesn't know about using covers to protect crops, prolong the season and cheat the weather. You could write on the back of a stamp and still have room to lick it. Nikki starts by talking about her background in gardening and why she wrote the book. Well, I kind of became, I think I became a gardener as a kid, like so many of us, Um, you know, really a vegetable gardener, just interested in the fact that the food that my family's small and very weedy and pretty unproductive vegetable garden produced, that it just tasted so much better than the stuff you would buy uh, in the grocery store or even at the farmer's market. It was just so delicious. So that kind of sparked my interest early. Um, I did study in university and get a degree uh, in English and history. But then I realized I could actually study horticulture, and I then went off and studied horticulture. Um, eventually started writing, combining those two degrees. And, um, you know, as I, I guess, learned more in my food gardening experiences in my own garden, I really kind of uh, experimented with season extension, um, you know, trying to take my zone five garden uh, and harvest year round. Because wh- when I grew up, it was like a late May to early September garden, and then it was frost. And, you know, there wasn't too much you could do, you know, other than deal with the frost and the garden was over. So using garden covers and season extension techniques um, allows me to harvest year round. Even again, I live in the northern climate in Canada, um, but I still can do that. So that was fascinating to me. So, you know, I did study horticulture, um, but I think I learned most from trial and error in my own garden. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have got a slightly more challenging climate, I think, probably than a lot of people listening. Um, But your book is amazing. It's so detailed. It's got such a lot of information in it. Um, But I thought we could start with the fundamentals, which is in the context of your book, what is a cover? Yeah, and that's a really good question. And and I thought about that a lot as I, you know, prepped for the book, as I wrote the book, even afterwards. Um, You know, I think a garden cover is anything that can be used to protect the plant. So there's lots of reasons you might want to protect a plant. You know, I can look around my backyard right now. I'm sitting outside by my garden and I have so many bunnies this year. There's deer, there's groundhogs, there's squirrels and chipmunks. But then there's also going to be cabbage worms and slugs and cucumber beetles and potato bugs. And then, of course, you know, even though I think we're going to be frost free at this point in spring, a frost is still possible. So I'm keeping my garden covers handy because of that. So a garden cover really is anything that'll protect your plants from you know, past their weather or, or so many other issues that pop up as we garden. So, you know, it could be something simple as a row cover. Uh, it could be a, a polytunnel, a walk-in structure, um, or it could be a blanket of mulch to protect carrots and parsnips uh, for winter harvesting. So a garden cover, I think, is a pretty uh, versatile term and can mean many different things. Yeah, because I think a lot of people naturally assume a garden cover is going to be something that extends the growing season. Um, but obviously, in as you write in the book, they're useful year round. Do, do, do you always find yourself using them in the garden? Yeah, there, there's never a time of the year that I'm not using some sort of garden cover. Um, so even though I, I'm hoping we're frost free now, I've been erecting my mini hoop tunnels over top of a couple of my beds and then covering them with like bird netting. Because I know the chipmunks, the squirrels, the birds like to eat the ground cherries that I'm, I'm starting to plant out now. So just to protect those plants, um, as well as the bunnies that seem to have invaded my garden this spring, uh, I'm using different types of row covers and insect nettings and things like that to keep them out of the garden. So, you know, in high summer when it's really hot, 
uh, and the soil is dry, I'm using shade cloth. And I'm doing that so I can help establish summer crops of carrots and, and other root crops and greens that I can then harvest in the winter. But those are planted in the middle of summer when it's hot and dry. So, you know, shade cloth lets me do that. And then, of course, you know, I'm often known as the crazy winter garden lady, which is totally accurate uh, because in the winter I have so many types of garden covers from simple ones like, the, again, the blanket of mulch uh, to, you know, my walk-in poly tunnel, uh, as well as cold frames and mini hoop tunnels. So, you know, no matter what time of the year it is, there is a garden cover you can use to help you grow healthier plants and a bigger crop. Yeah, so um, obviously you've mentioned keeping things, excluding pests from a crop. Is that the main way that covers help with pest management? I think so. I mean, there's so many types of pests that can invade our gardens. And I think generally we have the same ones from year to year and we develop strategies on how to deal with those. So for me, it's generally deer and slugs. Um, and, you know, deer have been a problem in my garden since I planted my first seed. Uh, and so I do have an electric fence around my garden, a barrier, which is really the most effective way to keep deer out of the garden, some sort of fencing. Um, but I, you know, I also have raised beds outside of my electric fence because I expanded my garden this year. We've all been locked down. So I thought, huh, let's add some more raised beds. But I couldn't fit them within the electric fence. So they're outside the fence. And therefore, I am using uh, the mini hoops with different covers to keep the deer away from my crops. Um, but I think it definitely uh, is a great way to exclude pests, whether they're large pests or small pests, um, you know, Colorado potato beetles, cucumber beetles, squash bugs, cabbage worms. These are all very common garden pests, you know, uh, in many parts of the world. And using lightweight garden covers is a great way to prevent them from damaging your crops. Sometimes I'll just put them on early in the season so the plants get a nice head start. Other times, if, if it's a crop like, you know, broccoli or cabbage or potatoes that don't need to be pollinated, I can leave those lightweight garden covers on the entire season and not have to deal with, you know, uh, cabbage worms, you know, eating all my broccoli leaves or my cabbage leaves. So there's many ways you can use garden covers to reduce pest damage. Um, I would just think about what types of pests you encounter, whether they're big or small, uh, and then match that with the best cover. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes when I'm uh, constructing covers and my efforts are not anywhere near as good as yours. Um, I wonder if there's sometimes a trade off between having a secure cover that is impenetrable and that kind of versus the access that you can get when it comes to watering and weeding. Is that, a, is that an issue you faced? Uh, not too much because my covers aren't like locked down completely around the outside of the bed. Uh, they're often floated over top of the bed. And I do like to float them on hoops just because it looks tidier uh, and it just gives the garden a better appearance, I think. Um, as well, it's nice when the covers aren't directly touching the plant, uh, especially in the cold season. That can cause some some cold damage uh, to be transferred to the, the leaves of the plant. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, generally my covers are weighed down, often with rocks or logs or, um, you know, strapping wood, like wooden boards and things like that to hold them in place. You can use things like staples, you know, to push through row covers, but they leave holes, so I don't generally use those. So I can always lift up the side of a cover uh, or the end of a cover um, and then, you know, weed or water. And for the most part, the covers I use in spring and summer and early autumn, like row covers, uh, insect barrier netting, things like that, they're permeable to water. And they also let a lot of light through as well, so I don't have to worry too much about um, the plant's not getting water when it rains, for example. Uh, and if, you know, I'm using a plastic cover for frost in early spring or winter or autumn, um, then, yeah, I'll just lift it up and cover it. Uh, but generally, it's pretty easy. And as for weeds, I like to think I've got a handle on weeds <laughs> in that I never let them go to seed in my raised bed. So, you know, weeding probably about 10 to 15 minutes a week, my 30 beds, keeps the weeds pretty much in check. Um, although when I do use, like, manures and things in my garden and compost, Sometimes I get a few new weed seeds that I don't expect because they traveled in with the, with the soil amendment. Um, but, you know, I, I think being vigilant and making sure you never let weeds go to seed in your garden means that after a couple of seasons, you'll probably have a really few weeds. And I also mulch. So my tomatoes, you know, my squash, my, my peppers, my cucumbers, all those vegetables are mulched with straw uh, or shredded leaves. And that also helps reduce weed growth. So therefore, I don't have to weed nearly as much. That's, that's really interesting. So when you mulch with straw... Is it possible that you are sometimes trapping things under the cover that you didn't actually want in there? <laughs> uh, well, when I when I use straw mulch, I don't generally put it on until after my seedlings are growing well. So if I planted vegetable seeds, I don't cover them up with mulch until, you know, they're good-sized plants. Um, but you, you could be trapping weed seeds under there. But if the conditions aren't right for weed seeds to grow, if they don't have access to light, uh, you know, they're not going to germinate. So it actually can help 
uh, slow the germination of weed seeds as well. Because, I mean, generally, garden soils have a weed bank, uh, you know, a bank of seeds in the soils. And when conditions are right, they're going to grow. So, you know, especially if you're a no-dig gardener, by not killing or exposing and, and lifting up that soil and those weed seeds to light, you know, they can remain in the soil for many, many years and not grow. Um, and mulching just helps, again, uh, reduce the chances they'll germinate. So it really is quite beneficial. So you mentioned that obviously you like to keep it looking tidy and that's why you use the floating covers. Um, I think maybe some people are a little bit averse to covering things up in the garden because they might think that it can look like a bit of an eyesore, again, especially if someone like me builds it. How do you combat that? What are your top tips for making it look attractive? Yeah, I I think having a nice looking garden, I mean, it's important to me. I think a vegetable garden is beautiful anyway. And, you know, I think, you know, when I was a kid growing up, you know, 30 plus years ago, people automatically, I think, thought vegetable gardens weren't that attractive. They were tucked in the backyard. They were tucked out of sight. They were tucked at the edge of the property or as far away from the house and the outdoor living area as they could possibly be because it was just a utilitarian space. It wasn't meant to be pretty. Um, but I think we've come a long way. And most homeowners, as well as, of course, gardeners, recognize that food gardens are beautiful, whether they're planted in long rows, whether they're raised beds, um, you know, whether they're growing containers on a, on a sunny deck or patio. These are beautiful spaces. And of course, I do lots of, um, you know, a planting of flowers and herbs, um, you know, and I've raised beds as well, which I think looks tidy. Uh, so there's lots of things you can do to make your garden look even, you know, more ornamental. But I, again, I think people have a, a much a broader view of what an attractive garden is now. And I think food gardens fall into that category. You know, I have a polytunnel in my backyard. I would have loved like a glass gothic greenhouse, but I mean, that cost of that was far out of my budget reach. So I have a polytunnel. And at first I thought, you know, people are going to think this isn't a very attractive structure because it's just like metal hoops covered in plastic. But my gosh, people have really responded well to the polytunnel. I share photos all the time on my social media, uh, in particular on Instagram. And, you know, it's become my happy place. Uh, you know, it's a beautiful spot. I even put a little patio, a six foot by seven foot patio in the back of it so we can sit in there, watch the tomatoes grow and just enjoy that lovely sheltered space, especially on days when the weather isn't quite so fine, which is pretty often here in Atlantic Canada. Um, but I think if you want to keep a tidy space, if your only sunny space is a front yard garden, you know, then put in a raised bed or two. Um, if you're going to use garden covers, use, you know, PVC or metal hoops uh, to hold those covers above the beds and make them look nice and tidy. But generally, I think, again, people have, um, you know, don't mind the look of a vegetable garden anymore. And they understand that this is an important type of garden. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I don't really worry about that at all. I love the idea of covers under covers. And uh, to my shame, it had never occurred to me to have a polytunnel and then to cover stuff up inside it. So can you elaborate a bit on that technique? Yeah, I love that too. Doubling up covers is such a great way. Um, you know, to protect crops that maybe aren't quite as hardy for your zone, particularly in winter and, you know, early spring uh, or late autumn. So those are the seasons. So shoulder seasons of spring and fall or winter when I'm doing that. Um, so for example, in my polytunnel, um, you know, in winter time, there are, there's a portion of one of my beds in there that's mulched with like a foot or more of straw. Underneath that mulch are artichokes, which are hardy to zone seven, but I'm in zone five. But underneath that polytunnel cover, and the straw mulch, my artichokes over winter. Um, so I get the most beautiful globe artichokes. You know, right now they're already three feet tall in the greenhouse, even though it's just early June. Uh, and we're soon going to harvest those first delicious artichokes, and I can't wait. But also um, my salad greens, my carrots, my parsley, and cilantro in winter in my polytunnel. Uh, over top those beds inside the tunnel, I'll have some simple wire hoops, just like nine-gauge wire, bent in, into a U-shape over the bed, covered with a lightweight uh, row cover. And that just gives me a little bit of extra protection when the nights are especially frigid. Uh, Because here in, you know, Nova Scotia, our winter temperatures can be, you know, minus 20, minus 25. Um, You know, and yes, if it's a bright, sunny day in the winter, sometimes we'll get a little bit of extra, um, you know, light coming through. But for the most part, uh, it's still pretty cold in there in the wintertime. So having that extra layer of cover, uh, it's just another way to, to, you know, add more insulation to your vegetables. So I do often have a mini heat tunnel in there, even cold frames. I have portable cold frames and I can pop those over top the beds in my mini or my poly tunnel. Or, you know, if I have a, a, um, a cold frame in the garden, sometimes inside that in the winter, I'll have a layer of mulch, straw mulch over top of parsnips or carrots or beets. So there's a double layer inside that cold frame as well. So you can certainly um, combine different types of garden covers, uh, especially when you are in cold climates. 
Yeah, just as you were speaking, it made me wonder, I know this is probably a slightly technical question, but if the ambient temperature was a certain amount, what do you think that you could kind of be achieving or almost, you know, what temperatures are you cheating in a way to reach to in terms of overwintering things like artichokes when you shouldn't technically be able to you know could you maybe make an estimate as to how much warmer it is uh, well i think honestly using a poly tunnel for example moves me at least a zone maybe a zone and a half to the south um, and then adding another cover inside like a row cover moves me probably another zone so i go from being a five zone five to like zone seven seven b um but in terms of temperature like oftentimes it will be say you know, minus 10 degrees outside, you know, on a cloudy day here in the wintertime. And if I go in the polytunnel, it's probably going to be six or seven degrees. Uh, and underneath one of my little row covers, it'll be about three or four degrees warmer as well. So it certainly does make a difference. It is going to depend, of course, on the, the type of row cover you're using. There's lightweight, there's medium weight, there's heavyweight, there's different brand names. So there's a lot of different factors that can, um, you know, play into the actual exact temperature as well as the weather whether it's cloudy or sunny or you know rainy or snowing um in the winter time too that's going to play a difference uh but yeah i mean the polytunnel during the daytime can make a difference of 20 degrees celsius uh depending on the weather and then using another type of cover inside like a row cover will again you know add anywhere from three to four degree protection if it's a heavyweight row cover um something that's you know blocking like 50 or 60 percent of the light but is really nice and dense in terms of temperature uh, and how much uh, temperature it can hold and insulation it provides you could be talking six or seven degrees of additional uh, heat under there so it really can be significant um and it, again it just depends on the covers and the weather yeah and does it stop fluctuating temperatures um, a bit because i notice at the moment we're seeing sort of six degrees overnight inside the polytunnel and then 40 degrees in the day um you know does can it can it help buffer that yeah, for sure. Like, you know, for the most part, if you have a greenhouse or a polytunnel, you could be using shade cloth inside or even outside on top of your polytunnel to help offset those daytime temperatures. Um, one of the reasons I went with a polytunnel as well is because, as I'm sure you know, it is really hard to ventilate a greenhouse well without some sort of electrical fan um, during the day. It heats up in there super quick. Uh, you know, today, you know, we went from like, I think it was six or seven degrees a couple of days ago Celsius. Today, it's going to be 29 Celsius. So, you know, it, it can be tough on plants growing in a polytunnel for those extreme temperature shifts. Um, but having a roll-up size in my polytunnel makes ventilation super easy. So the first thing I did this morning was grab my cup of tea, go up to the greenhouse, roll up those sides all the way on the polytunnel, open the door, open the windows. Um, and, you know, I know it won't, won't be super hot in there. If I had it closed up, it would be 40 or plus degrees in there. Um, but opening the sides like that and allowing lots of ventilation uh, means the temperature will probably stay between 25 and 29 as the day goes on today. I do have um, a, 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 a thermometer that tells me the exact temperature on my phone in my kitchen. So I love to monitor the greenhouse temperature so I can just kind of see what the temperature is outside and then what it is inside the polytunnel. It's really fun to uh, keep an eye on that. But of course, you don't want your vegetables <clears throat> excuse me, to be all of a sudden in 40 degrees Celsius. That's far too hot. Um, especially if you still have cool season vegetables in there, like I do, spinach, lettuce, things like that. I, I want the temperature to stay uh, much cooler. So ventilation, I think, is key with garden covers. Even if we're talking a mini hoop tunnel, something you know, relatively small over a four by eight foot bed, it's important to ventilate that. So right now, I have been using mini hoop tunnels over my newly transplanted tomatoes in the bed, and I am lifting those ends up during the days so that the air can circulate through, uh, condensation doesn't build up, and the temperature you know doesn't spike during the day. So ventilation, I think, is key. At nighttime, I close all those structures up so they can, you know, it does get down to about seven or eight degrees here at night. So they're closed up uh, and protected against the nighttime temperatures and potential frost. Uh, but during the day, they're open fully so I can have maximum ventilation. And obviously, we've spoken about the benefits, but um, aside from maybe uh, ventilation, are there any other common problems people might, uh, you know, encounter when they're using covers? Yeah, for sure. There I mean, there are certainly things to watch out for. Uh, for example, I highly recommend crop rotation <laughs> because if you're growing something like, you know, zucchini or squash and you have a problem with things like squash bugs, um, and if you just grow them in the same space every year and cover them with a garden cover, you could be trapping that pest under a cover with their favorite food. So you definitely want to practice crop rotation. I think it's really important. Um, also, we talked about venting for temperature, but it's also important in terms of humidity. You don't want uh, too much humidity in a structure, particularly a walk-in structure like a greenhouse or polytunnel, because that can encourage different types of diseases. 
Um, so I, I certainly like to uh, vent well. So the humidity is too high in there. That's something to watch out for too. Um, but, you know, and then the other issue I would think is more of a winter issue. I live in an area where we get nor'easters, where we get a lot of hurricanes. So if I'm using covers in late fall, um, I find certainly during those storms that we get, uh, if they're not fastened well, you know, and those, that's the time when those covers are pretty much on for the whole winter. So they're not just on there for, you know, two or three weeks to cover my fall spinach. They're covering vegetables I want to harvest all winter long. So I do want to make sure they stay attached to the bed and don't blow off in a winter storm or a late fall storm. So I'll secure them to the bed with strapping. You can also buy clips. Um, I use uh, snap clamps, which are like C-shaped clips that just hold those covers tightly to the hoops. Um, you know, I used to have to make my own 20 years ago, but now lots of places sell them. So it's been a game changer for me. Uh, so I use usually three clips per hoop and it holds those covers nice and tightly. So I would say, make sure you're venting for humidity. Um, you know, make sure you're keeping those uh, covers on very securely during the times of year when storms are likely, which would be, you know, early spring, late fall for me and winter when we have a lot of winter snowstorms and stuff too. Um, but yeah, there's, I think with anything, there can be some challenges, but overall garden covers have made such a difference in my harvest. I mean, again, there's 30 types of vegetables I harvest in the winter from my zone five garden in Nova Scotia. Um, so the fact that I probably spend, you know, five or 10 minutes a week, uh, checking my covers and such to me, isn't that big of a deal. It certainly offsets the fact that I get to supply uh homegrown organic food to my family 365 days a year. Yeah, that's amazing. If people wanted to try, I don't know, maybe three uh, crops that they could uh, try over wintering here, what would you recommend, um, given that our temperatures are probably slightly above yours, in certainly in the south of England, but, you know, what would you recommend that people try? Yeah, you definitely, uh, you have slightly warmer temperatures than me, but you also have less light, I believe. Uh, I have a longer day length. So some of my favorite crops for winter, I think people should grow what they like to eat. Um, but some of the ones that my family has to have each winter are carrots, which are, I mean, gosh, so easy to grow. Um, so I usually plant my carrots for winter harvesting in late July. Um, and then they're deep mulched in late November, early December um, with straw or shredded leaves. And we harvest them all winter long. And so that one's really easy. Same thing applies for parsnips or carrots or even celery root. Um, and then for salad greens, because I want to eat salad every day. And there's nothing like homegrown salad greens. Um, so I look for varieties of lettuce, for example, that are more winter hardy. You know, I think when you're reading your seed catalog, read the descriptions carefully because there's heat tolerant lettuces great for summer. There's cold tolerant lettuces for, you know, spring and fall. And then there's some really ultra cold tolerant lettuces for winter harvesting. Things like winter density, North Pole. These are lettuces I love to grow and I harvest from them all winter long. So I would say carrots, winter lettuces. And then it's a toss up between, I would say, arugula and spinach because I love them both. But they're also really cold tolerant. But then there's also some, you know, maybe lesser known vegetables like salad greens, like mosh, um, you know, corn salad uh, or claytonia, or even some of the Asian greens like mizunas or uh, tatsoi, um, you know, or yukina savoy. There's a lot of different varieties out there that I couldn't find 20 years ago and 25 years ago when I started doing this. But now seed catalogs carry so many of these uh, winter hardy vegetables that it's easy to source them. Um, which makes it really easy for, you know, uh, gardeners to, to learn how to grow them and harvest them all winter long. Yeah, Mizuna is just the best crop ever. It just is so forgiving. <laughs> you can do anything to it and it's happy. <laughs> which makes a great vegetable, right? Any vegetable that's forgiving is top on my list. Yeah, and me, definitely. Um, <laughs> so obviously we've spoken about, you know, the polytunnel and uh, various different uh, techniques that you can use. But is it suitable for smaller gardens? If someone had a very, very tiny space, would it work? Um, I think you have to look at your space when you're looking at garden cover. So the first thing I say is, why do you want to cover your crops? What types of goals are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to prevent pests? Are you trying to extend the season? Are you trying to harvest all winter long? Are you trying to create a microclimate around your crops? Because in some parts, of course, uh, of the UK and Canada, it's hard to mature heat-loving vegetables like tomatoes, like hot peppers, like eggplants, things like that. So having a, a greenhouse or a polytunnel can help you achieve that. Um, but you need to look around your property and make sure you have a right, the right site which is level is, is, is easy in terms of building. It makes it, you know, so much easier, but also sun. You need lots of sunlight, you know, eight hours a day of direct sun is really quite essential for garden covers like a polytunnel or greenhouse. So if you can find that without the shade um, of a tree or a building or a shed or something, uh, then go for it. You know, there are different structures in all sizes. You can, you know, my polytunnel is 14 by 24 feet, but you can find some that are six by eight feet, you know, four by six feet. 
even even ultra small ones that aren't walk-in but are more like bookshelves that are like little greenhouses. You can even grow certain vegetables in those. Um, so I would say look at your site and match the structure to the size that you can. If you can go a little bigger than you want it to, I would recommend it because I tell you, once you get a greenhouse or a polytunnel or even a geodesic dome on site, you'll never say, gosh, this is too big for me. <laughs> Gardeners always like, man, why didn't I go bigger? Because we can always plant more food crops or use the extra space for potting up, for seeding, for you know, sitting and enjoying our cup of tea. Um, so, you know, look at your space. If you don't have space for a walk-in structure, use a cold frame if you can. Cold frames are great. They're little mini food factories. Um, they're just bottomless boxes with clear tops, and they really allow you to harvest year around as well. Um, so if you don't have space for walk-in structure, consider smaller structures like cold frames or mini food tunnels. Mm, brilliant advice. And um, so finally, my, my last question is, you do cover this in depth in the book um, brilliantly, but in your opinion, um, does it have to cost a lot to install covers and can they be eco-friendly? Yes, that's a great question. Um, it doesn't have to cost a lot because I am a frugal gardener myself. I don't like to spend a lot of money on things. So, um, you know, I've got tips in there on how to save money when you're buying roll covers or, or polyethylene covers. Um, you know, often I buy them by the roll uh, and that we can use them for many years. Uh, but, you know, there's so many places now that sell them. You can certainly comparison shop as well. Or if you have gardening friends, part of a community garden, part of a gardening club and allotment, then my gosh, you you know, you can do a group order and then everybody can share the different types of covers and split them up that way. But you can even buy small covers, you know, like uh, seven foot by 50 foot covers. It only costs around, well, here, $20 Canadian. So they're not that expensive. And gentle care, you know, they last many years. Um, you know, so if you want to reduce and be more eco-friendly, uh, you know, I would make sure that if you're investing in something that's plastic, like a, a polyethylene cover, I would buy something that's going to last for a long time because you don't want to buy disposable plastic. I want to use as little plastic as possible as I can in my garden. So when I make a mini hoop tunnel and cover it in clear plastic, I'm going to use a greenhouse plastic, something that's UV treated, something that's, you know, six mil thick, something that's going to last me six or seven or eight years or longer. Um, I'm not going to use like uh, an inexpensive clear plastic like you can buy when you, you know, paint the inside of your house like a drop cloth. Those are only about one and a half to two mil thick, and they only last really a couple months. So I don't want disposable plastic. I want stuff that I can use for many years, and then when I'm done with it, I can recycle it. Um, but of course, you can also upcycle and recycle lots of materials, like for cloches, water jugs, and milk jugs, and you know different types of jars and things like that. Um, you know, you can make you know mini hoop tunnels out of you know old wire, uh, old hula hoops, old materials. Um, I've even seen people make greenhouses from old trampoline like skeletons. So I think if you're handy and you want to upcycle and recycle materials, you're going to start to see things like differently. Um, and I'm sure you can create some really fun things, uh, but you don't have to always buy new. And, you know, when you do buy new, there are many ways that you can kind of cut costs and, and slash your gardening budget. Thanks, Nikki. Please go and take a look at her website, SavvyGardening.com, which she runs with her business partner, Jessica Wallace of episode 111 fame. Thanks as always for listening. Please remember to visit harvest.co.uk and take advantage of the 5% discount on all four seasons and eco mini greenhouse orders from now until the end of July. Enter the code roots and all, all uppercase at the checkout. So you probably know by now that I don't kill anything in my garden. But if I had to make an exception, it would be for these antlered armoured thugs who try and smash in your windows at around this time of year. During May, in gardens all across Britain, a rather clumsy-looking, inch-long creature will start to emerge from the ground and at dusk launch itself into the sky, whirring and humming as it goes. Displaying unexpected flying skills, its mission to find a tree where it'll feed on the leaves can often be disrupted by light emitted from our homes that fool it into crashing headlong into a window pane. This creature is the adult cockchafer, a beetle that is the largest of Britain's eight native chafer species, and is easily recognised by its reddish-brown wing cases, a hairy black body with white triangular stripes along each side, and a pair of spectacular orange fan-like antennae. And despite an ominous-looking sharp point at the end of its body, cockchafers are completely harmless to us living for just a few weeks whilst they find mates and produce eggs that are laid into the ground. Being such a large and distinctive beetle, 
they've not gone unnoticed over time, being mentioned in folklore and, from the ancient Greeks to the Victorians, they've been tethered to yarn and flown by young children as living toys. And so it's not surprising that they've acquired an assortment of rather endearing names, such as the Billy Witch, Michamador, Doodlebug, Humbuzz, and simply the May or the June Bug. Well, despite cockchafers being completely harmless to us, we can't really say the same for our plants, since when conditions are right, little white C-shaped grubs begin hatching from the underground eggs, and using their six sturdy legs, they start tunnelling through the soil to find plants where they can eat roots for the next three to four years whilst they mature into adults. And for hundreds of years, cockchafer grubs remain the most notorious pests of wheat and barley crops until the early 20th century, when toxic pesticides became so widely used in agriculture that the cockchafer species became scarce. Nowadays, though, pesticide use is well regulated, and cockchafers are common again. But they're no longer a significant pest of cereal crops. Instead, it's parks and gardens where they're most frequently found, and where plant root damage is most likely to occur. And when it's severe, cockchafers might need controlling. However, with no approved pesticides currently available, an alternative natural method would have to be used, either by adding large numbers of naturally occurring parasitic nematodes, or by using the no-cost option of digging the grubs out by hand. Otherwise, maybe just accept the cockchafers as part of the garden wildlife, and a nutritious home-produced food source for the hedgehogs and the birds. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.